In therapy I timidly say I want to try it, I want to express that rage, but with a professional there to help pull me out if I get stuck in it. I get on the floor. I try to yell, but I can't, I'm too scared, I curl into a smaller and smaller ball. I need to feel a limit around me, a boundary, I need to feel something to push against. I tell my therapist to sit on me. He is heavy, his weight almost suffocates me. I think I am going to pass out. I am about to tap the floor, to beg him to let me up, to give up this silly experiment. But then a scream comes out of me, so long and full and anguished that it frightens me, what awful wounded thing would make a noise like that? But I can't stop making the sound. It feels good. More than thirty years of silence ghosts come roaring out of me now, the full-throated outpouring of my sorrow. It feels good. I scream, I scream, I push against the weight bearing down on me. My therapist doesn't make it easy, and the effort makes me cry and sweat. What happens? What happens when the long-denied part of me is let out? Nothing happens. I feel the force of the rage, and it doesn't kill me after all. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm alive. It still isn't easy for me to talk about the past. It is deeply painful to confront the fear and the loss all over again each time I remember or recount it. But from this moment on, I understood that feelings, no matter how powerful, aren't fatal. And they are temporary. Suppressing the feelings only makes it harder to let them go. Expression is the opposite of depression. In 1978, my son, John, graduated from the University of Texas, one of the top ten students, and I earned my Ph.D. in clinical psychology. It was a triumphant year for our family. I decided to pursue my licensure in California because it was the toughest state, there I was, putting on the red shoes again, and beyond the ego needs of proving my worth as though a piece of paper could accomplish that, California licensure had the practical advantage of allowing me to practice anywhere in the country. I remembered Bela's struggle to earn his CPA license, and I girded myself for a difficult journey. I needed 3,000 clinical hours to sit for the exam, but I doubled the requirement. I didn't even sign up to take the exam until I had 6,000 hours, almost all at William Beaumont where I had developed such a good reputation that I was asked to conduct sessions behind one-way glass, so that my fellow clinicians could observe my way of building rapport, establishing trust, and guiding patients toward new choices. Then it was time to face the written test. I was terrible at multiple-choice tests, I had to study for months even to pass the driving test. Somehow, through gritty persistence or sheer luck, I passed the written exam. But not on my first try. Finally, I sat for the oral exam, which I thought would be the easiest part of the process. Two men conducted the interview, one who wore blue jeans and had long hair pulled back in a ponytail, and another who wore a suit and had a crew cut. They grilled me for hours. The man with long hair spoke sharply, tersely asking me all the questions about statistics, ethics, and legal matters. The man with the crew cut asked all the philosophical questions, the ones that got my mind working more creatively, my heart more engaged. Overall, though, it was an unpleasant experience. I felt stiff and numb and vulnerable. The examiners didn't make it easy, their expressionless faces, cold voices, and emotional distance were alienating. It was hard to put my energy into the next question when each previous one left me churning with self-criticism, with the desire to go back and revise what I had said, to say something, anything, that would elicit a nod of recognition or encouragement. When the exam finally ended, I felt dazed, my hands shook, I was both starving and nauseated, my head hurt. I was sure I had blown it. 
Just as I reached the front door, I heard footsteps behind me, someone running to catch up. Had I left my purse behind in my disorientation? Were they telling me already that I had failed? Dr. Ager, the man with the crew cut called. I braced myself, as though awaiting a punishment. He reached me, paused to catch his breath. My jaw and shoulders clenched. At last the man extended his hand. Dr. Ager, it was an honor. You have a wealth of knowledge. Your future patients are very lucky indeed. When I got back to my hotel, I jumped on the bed like a little girl. Chapter 16 The Choice My joyous optimism, my sense of professional accomplishment, my feeling that I was reaching a full embodiment and expression of myself all withered when I established my private practice and met my first patient. I visited him in the hospital where he had been living for a month, awaiting diagnosis and undergoing treatment for what turned out to be stomach cancer. He was terrified. He felt betrayed by his body, threatened by his mortality, overwhelmed by the uncertainty and loneliness of illness. And I couldn't reach him where he was. All of my skill in establishing a climate of warmth and trust, in building a bridge between me and my patient, had disappeared. I felt like a child dressed up in a doctor's white coat. A fake. My expectations of myself were so high, my fear of failure so toppling, that I couldn't see past my own self-absorption to reach the man who was asking for my help and my love. Will I ever be healthy again? he asked, and my mind flipped like a Rolodex spinning through theories and techniques, my eyes pointed at the wall, trying to mask how nervous and scared I was. I was of no help to him. He didn't invite me back. I realized, as I had when I met Tom, the paraplegic veteran, that my professional success had to come from a deeper place within me, not from the little girl trying to please others and win approval but from my whole and authentic self, the one who was vulnerable and curious who was accepting of herself and ready to grow. In other words, I began to formulate a new relationship with my own trauma. It wasn't something to silence, suppress, avoid, negate. It was a well I could draw on, a deep source of understanding and intuition about my patients, their pain, and the path to healing. My first years of private practice helped me to reframe my wound as something necessary and useful and to shape and develop my most enduring therapeutic principles. Often the patients I worked with mirrored my own discoveries about the journey to freedom. Equally often they taught me that my search for freedom wasn't complete, and they pointed me in the direction of further healing. Although Emma was the identified patient, I met her parents first. They had never spoken to anyone, least of all a stranger, about the secret in their family, Emma their oldest child, was starving herself to death. They were private, reserved people, a conservative German-American family, their faces creased with worry, eyes filled with fear. We're looking for practical solutions, Emma's father told me that first visit. We have to get her to start eating again. We heard that you're a survivor, Emma's mother added. We thought Emma could learn something from you that you might inspire her. It was heartbreaking to see their panic for Emma's life, to see their shock. Nothing in life had prepared them for a child with an eating disorder, they had never considered that something like this could happen to their daughter and their family, and none of their existing parenting tools was having a positive effect on Emma's health. I wanted to reassure them. I wanted to ease their distress but I also wanted them to begin to see a truth that might be even more painful for them to acknowledge than Emma's illness, that they had a part in it. When a child is grappling with anorexia, the identified patient is the child, but the real patient is the family. They wanted to tell me every detail of Emma's behaviors that concerned them, the food she refused to eat, the food she pretended to eat, 
the food they would find tucked inside napkins after family meals, the food they discovered stuffed into her dresser drawers, the way she pulled away from them and retreated behind closed doors, the terrifying changes in her body. But I asked them instead to talk about themselves, which they did with obvious discomfort. Emma's father was short and compact, he was a soccer player, I learned. He looked a little like Hitler, I realized with unease, he had a thin mustache and dark, pressed hair, and a way of barking when he talked, as though behind every communication was the insistence on not being ignored. Later I would have individual sessions with each of Emma's parents, and I would ask her father how he had decided on his career as a police officer. He told me that as a boy he had walked with a limp, and his father had called him Shrimpy Limpy. He chose to be a police officer because it required risk-taking and physical strength. He wanted to prove to his father that he wasn't a shrimp or a cripple. When you have something to prove, you aren't free. Even though I didn't yet know anything about his childhood during our first visit, I could tell that Emma's father was living in a prison of his own making, he was living within a limited image of who he should be. He behaved more like a drill sergeant than a supportive husband or concerned father. He didn't ask questions, he ran an interrogation. He didn't acknowledge his fears or vulnerabilities, he asserted his ego. His wife, who wore a tailored cotton dress with buttons down the front and a thin belt, a look that was both timeless and no-nonsense seemed hyper-tuned to his tone and speech. He talked for a few minutes about his frustrations at work when he was skipped over for a promotion, and I could see her searching for a careful balance point between affirming his indignation and stoking his anger. She had clearly learned that her husband needed to be right, that he couldn't handle being confronted or contradicted. In our private session, would be impressed by her resourcefulness. She mowed the lawn and did many of their home repairs, she made her own clothes, and the seeming contradiction between her skills and the power she gave over to her husband, the price she paid to keep the peace. Her habit of avoiding conflict with her husband at all costs was as damaging to her daughter's health and their family dynamic as were his domineering behaviors. They were partners in making control, not empathic connection, not unconditional love the language of the family. This is a waste of time, Emma's father finally said during our first visit, after answering my questions about his job, their family routines, how they celebrated holidays. Just tell us what to do. Yes, just tell us how we can get Emma to come to the table at mealtime, her mother begged. Tell us how we can make her eat. I can see how worried you are about Emma. I can see how desperate you are for answers and fixes. And I can tell you that if you want Emma to get well, your first job is to understand that with anorexia, the issue isn't only what Emma eats, it's also about what's eating her. I couldn't just fix her and send her back, her healthy self, I told them. I invited them to help me, to be my co-therapists, to observe their daughter but not with the agenda of making her do or be anything different, just paying attention to her emotional states and behaviors. Together we could build a clearer picture of her emotional landscape and get more familiar with the psychological aspects of the disease. By enlisting their help and cooperation, I hope to lead them toward an understanding of their part in her illness. I was nudging them toward taking responsibility for the way they contributed to what was eating Emma. The following week, I met Emma for the first time. She was 14 years old. It was like meeting my own ghost. She looked like I had at Auschwitz, skeletal, pale. She was wasting away. Her long, stringy blonde hair made her face look even thinner. She stood in the doorway of my office, her two long sleeves pulled all the way down over her hands. She looked like a person with a secret. With any new patient, it's important to be sensitive to his or her psychological boundaries from the very first moments of our initial encounter. 
I must intuit immediately if this is a person who wants me to take her hand or keep my physical distance. If this is a person who needs me to give him an order or a gentle suggestion. For a patient with anorexia, a disease that is all about control, about relentless rules for what and when you eat or don't eat, for what you reveal or conceal, these first moments are critical. For one thing, anorexia has an inescapable physiological dimension. Because of the lack of nutrients entering the body, and because the bulk of the few calories consumed go to autonomic functions, breathing, elimination, the brain is deprived of blood flow, and this leads to distorted thinking and, in severe cases, paranoia. As a psychologist beginning a therapeutic relationship with a person with anorexia, I have to remember that I'm communicating with a person who likely has distorted cognitive functioning. It's easy for a habitual gesture, putting a hand on someone's shoulder as I guide her to a comfortable chair, for example, to be misinterpreted as threatening or invasive. As I greeted Emma for the first time, I tried to simultaneously warm and neutralize my body language. Because someone with anorexia is an expert at control, it's important to disarm her need for control by offering freedom. At the same time, it's vital to create a structured environment where there is safety in clear rules and rituals. Having met her parents, I knew that the home language was full of criticisms and blame, so I began our session with a compliment. Thank you for coming, I said. I'm so happy to finally meet you. And thank you for being right on time. When she had chosen a seat on the couch, I told her that anything she told me was confidential, unless her life was in danger. And then I made a soft, open-ended invitation. You know, your parents are so worried about you. I'm interested to know the real story. Is there anything you'd like to tell me? Emma didn't respond. She stared at the carpet tugging her sleeves even farther over her hands. It's okay to be silent, I said. More silence stretched between us. I waited. I waited some more. You know, I said after a while, it's fine for you to take as long as you need. I have a little paperwork I need to do. I'm going to go work in the other room. When you're ready, let me know. She eyed me suspiciously. In a home with punitive discipline, children grow accustomed to hearing threats, and these threats can escalate quickly or, at the other extreme, prove empty. Although I was speaking kindly, she was looking to see if my words and tone were going to escalate into an angry criticism or admonition, or if I wasn't really going to leave the room, if I was just a pushover. I think she was surprised when I simply stood up crossed the room, and opened the door. Only then, my hand on the doorknob, did she speak. I'm ready, she said. Thank you, I said, returning to my chair. I'm happy to hear that. We have forty minutes left. Let's use them well. Is it okay if I ask you a couple questions? She shrugged. Tell me about a typical day. What time do you wake up? She rolled her eyes, but she answered my question. I continued in this vein. Did she have a clock radio, or an alarm clock, or did her mother or father come to wake her up? Did she like to lie in bed for a while under the covers, or did she jump right out of bed? I asked her mundane questions, getting a sense of her daily life, but none of my questions had anything to do with food. It is so hard for someone with anorexia to see anything in life outside of food. I already knew from her parents that her focus on food was controlling her family, that all of their attention was consumed by her illness. I had a feeling she expected me, too, to be interested only in her illness. With my questions I was trying to shift her attention to other parts of her life, and to dismantle or at least soften her defensive structures. When I had worked through a day in her life, I asked her a question that she didn't know how to answer. 
what do you like to do? I asked. I don't know, she said. What are your hobbies? What do you like to do in your free time? I don't know. I walked over to the whiteboard that I keep in my office. I wrote, I don't know. As I asked her more questions about her interests, her passions, her desires, I put a check mark for every time she said, I don't know. What are your dreams for your life? I don't know. If you don't know, then guess. I don't know. I'll think about it. A lot of girls your age write poems. Do you write poems? Emma shrugged. Sometimes. Where would you like to be in five years? What kind of a life and career appeal to you? I don't know. I'm noticing that you say these words a lot, I don't know. But when the only thing you can think is I don't know, that saddens me. It means you're not aware of your options. And without options or choices, you aren't really living. Can you do something for me? Can you take this pen and draw me a picture? I guess. She walked to the board and pushed her thin hand out from her sleeve to take the pen. Draw me a picture of yourself, right now. How do you see yourself? She uncapped the pen and drew quickly, her lips pursed. She turned so I could see her drawing, a short, fat girl with a void, blank face. It was a devastating contrast, skeletal Emma beside a blank, fat cartoon. Can you remember a time when you felt different? When you felt happy and pretty and fun-loving? She thought and thought. But she didn't say, I don't know. Finally she nodded her head. When I was five. Could you draw me a picture of that happy girl? When she stepped away from the board, I saw a picture of a dancing, twirling girl in a tutu. I felt my throat catch, a spasm of recognition. Did you take ballet? Yes. I'd love to hear more about that. How did you feel when you were dancing? She closed her eyes. I saw her heels pull together in first position. It was an unconscious motion, her body remembering. What are you feeling right now as you remember? Can you give that feeling a word? She nodded, her eyes still closed. Free. Would you like to feel that way again? Free. Full of life? She nodded. She put the pen on the tray and tugged her sleeves down over her hands again. And how does starving yourself get you closer to this goal of freedom? I said it as warmly, as kindly as I could. It wasn't a recrimination. It was an effort to bring her into an unflinching awareness of her self-sabotage and of how far she had taken it. And it was an effort to help her answer the most important questions at the outset of any journey toward freedom, what am I doing now? Is it working? Is it bringing me closer to my goals, or farther away? Emma didn't answer my question in words. But in her teary silence I could sense her recognizing that she needed and wanted to change. When I met with Emma and her parents all together for the first time, I greeted them with enthusiasm. I have very good news. I said. I shared with them my hope, my confidence in their ability to work as a team. And I made my own participation in the teamwork conditional upon their agreeing that Emma would also be in the care of the medical staff at an eating disorder clinic, because anorexia is a serious, potentially fatal condition. If Emma ever got below a certain weight, which would be determined in consultation with the staff at the clinic, she would have to be hospitalized. I can't risk you losing your life over something that can be prevented, I told Emma. A month or two after I started working with Emma, her parents invited me to their home for a family meal. I met all of Emma's siblings. I noticed that Emma's mother introduced each of her children with qualifiers, 
this is Gretchen, the shy one, and Peter, the funny one, and Derek, the responsible one. Emma had already been introduced to me, the sick one. You give children a name, and they play the game. This is why I find it useful to ask my patients, what was your ticket of admission in your family? In my childhood, Clara was the prodigy, Magda was the rebel, and I was the confidant. I was most valuable to my parents when I was a listener, a container for their feelings, when I was invisible. Sure enough, at the table Gretchen was shy, Peter was funny, Derek was responsible. I wanted to see what would happen if I broke the code, if I invited one of the children into a different role. You know, I said to Gretchen, you have such a beautiful profile. Their mother kicked me under the table. Don't say that, she admonished me under her breath. She'll end up conceited. After dinner, while Emma's mother cleaned up in the kitchen, Peter, who was still a toddler, was pulling on her skirt, asking for her attention. She kept putting him off, and his attempts to get her to stop what she was doing and pick him up became more and more frantic. Finally he toddled out of the kitchen and went straight for the coffee table, where there were some porcelain knickknacks. His mom ran after him, swooped him up, spanked him, and said, Didn't I tell you not to touch those? The spare the rod spoil the child approach to discipline had created a climate in which the children seemed to get only negative attention, bad attention, after all, is better than no attention. The strict environment, the black and white nature of the rules and roles imposed on the children, the palpable tension between the parents, all made for an emotional famine in the home. I also witnessed the highly inappropriate attention that Emma's father paid her. Hey there, hottie, he said to her when she joined us in the living room after dinner. I saw her shrink into the couch, trying to cover herself. Control, punitive discipline, emotional incest, no wonder Emma was dying in the midst of plenty. Like all families, Emma and her family needed rules, but very different ones from those they were operating under. So I helped Emma and her parents to make a family constitution that they would help one another to enforce, a list of family rules that would improve the climate in their home. First, they talked about the behaviors that weren't working. Emma told her parents how much hearing them yell and blame frightened her, and how resentful she felt when they changed the rules or expectations at the last minute, what time she had to be home, what chores she had to finish before she could watch TV. Her father talked about how isolated he felt in the family, he felt like the only one disciplining the kids. Interestingly, Emma's mother said something similar, that she felt like she was parenting all alone. From the list of hurtful habits and behaviors, the things they wanted to stop doing, we built a short list of things they agreed to start doing. 1. Instead of blaming others, take responsibility for your own actions and speech. Before you say or do something, ask, is it kind? Is it important? Does it help? 2. Use teamwork to reach common goals. If the house needs cleaning, each member of the family has an age-appropriate job. If the family is going out to a movie, choose together which movie to see, or take turns getting to choose. Think of the family as a car where all the wheels are integrated and work together to move where it needs to go, no one will takes control, no one will bears all the weight. 3. Be consistent. If curfew has already been established, the rule can't change at the last minute. In general, Emma's family's constitution was about giving up the need to control someone else. I treated Emma for two years. In that time she completed the outpatient program at the eating disorder clinic. She stopped playing soccer, something her father had forced her into when she started middle school, and went back to ballet class and then on to more dance classes, belly dancing, salsa. The creative expression, the pleasure she took in moving to the music and rhythm, led to an enjoyment of her body, which gave her a healthier self-image. 
Near the end of our time together, when she was 16, she met a boy in school and fell in love, and this relationship gave her another motivation to live and to be healthy. By the time she stopped working with me, her body had filled out and her hair was thick and shining. She had become the present-day version of her picture of the twirling, dancing girl. The summer after Emma's junior year of high school, her family invited me to a barbecue at their house. They put out a wonderful spread, ribs, beans, German potato salad, homemade rolls. Emma stood with her boyfriend, filling a plate with food, laughing, flirting. Her parents, siblings, and friends sprawled on the lawn and in folding chairs, feasting. Food was no longer the negative language of the family. Emma's parents, though they hadn't completely transformed the tone of their parenting or their marriage, had learned to give Emma what she had learned to give herself, the space and trust to find her way toward the good in life. And without having to live consumed by their fear of what might happen to Emma, they had grown free to live their own lives. They had a weekly bridge night with a group of friends and had let go of much of the worry and anger and need to control that had poisoned their family life for so long. I was relieved and moved to see Emma restored to Emma. And her journey also prompted me to reflect on me. Edie. Was I at one with my own inner dancing girl? Was I living with her curiosity and ecstasy? Around the same time that Emma left my practice, my first grandchild, Marianne's daughter, Lindsay, began a toddler ballet class. Marianne sent me a picture of Lindsay in a little pink tutu, her sweet chubby feet tucked into a pair of tiny pink slippers. I wept when I saw the picture. Joyful tears, yes. But there was also an ache in my chest that had more to do with loss. I could picture Lindsay's life spreading out from this moment, her performances and recitals, sure enough, she would continue to study ballet and perform in the Nutcracker every winter of her childhood and adolescence, and the happiness I felt for her in anticipation of all she had to look forward to could not be uncoupled from the sorrow I felt at my own interrupted life. When we grieve, it's not just over what happened, we grieve for what didn't happen. I housed a year of horror within me. And I housed a vacant, empty place, the vast dark of the life that would never be. I held the trauma and the absence, I couldn't let go of either piece of my truth, nor could I hold either easily. Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.